Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our eighth lesson. The topic is ecology, and uh, in this this time we are going to look at symbiosis. In the previous lesson, you remember we looked at uh, parasitism as one of the interactions uh, between organisms, where we looked at different parasites, plasmodium, tapeworm, cystosomes, and trypanosomes. So in this lesson we are going to be looking at symbiosis uh, and other interactions among organisms. So what is symbiosis? This is the relationship between two organisms of different species in which both organisms benefit from the association. So in symbiosis basically all the organisms that are involved in the feeding relationships benefit. Unlike in parasitism where only one benefits. In symbiosis all the two benefit. So we are going to look at a number of examples of symbiosis. One uh, in the stomach of the cattle and sheep, there are a certain group of bacteria. And these bacteria produce an enzyme called cellulase. And that enzyme is used to digest cellulose, which is found in the grass and leaves eaten by the, these animals. So in the, in the two, both of them benefit because the bacteria gets uh, shelter and nourishment from the, the, the cow or the sheep and then in return the bacteria cell or the bacteria produce cellulase which is used by the cow or the sheep or the buffalo or generally the ruminants. So in this case all the two organisms do benefit in this relationship. So it is uh, a good example of symbiosis. The other one is the nitrogen fixing bacteria in the root nodules of the leguminous plants. In this kind of relationship, uh, the bacteria, the rhizobium bacteria or the nitrogen fixing bacteria, converts the nitrogen of the atmosphere into nitrates. And the nitrates are absorbed by the green plant or the legume and used for uh, production of plant proteins. All of us do eat beans and groundnuts, cow peas and so on and they are protein, protein rich food. So that's how the plants get their proteins from the nitrogen in the soil. And that nitrogen is fixed there by the nitrogen fixing bacteria, the rhizobium. And then in return, the rhizobium gets nourishment and uh, protection from the legume. So both organisms benefit. The other example is the lichen, which is composed of the fungus and the algae. In this relationship, the fungus constitutes the support structure the substratum that supports both the lichen and the uh, sorry that uh, gives support to the algae the algae is green in color and carries out photosynthesis producing food for sugars for both the fungus and itself the algae so the algae carries out photosynthesis the fungus provides support for both of them so all of them benefit. Algae manufactures food and then the fungus provides support and also absorbs water for as a raw material for photosynthesis. Great. So you can see there the lichen. Uh, this photo was taken from Musita in Mayuge where you see there in the back of that tree there is a beautiful lichen association there. Another one there uh, you can see the lichen growing there. On top there you can see the green algae and then 
on the bottom you could easily see the fungus. So that association there is called a lichen. Uh, great. So that is uh, symbiosis. So what is symbiosis, dear students? We said symbiosis was a relationship between, a feeding association between two organisms where both of them benefit. Great. So let's look at another feeding association called commensalism. That S is not there. It is called commensalism. And uh, in this association, uh, it's a relationship between the organisms of different species in which only one, the commensal, benefits. But the other organism neither benefits nor loses. So in commensalism, there is a feeding association between two organisms of different species. But only one organism benefits nutritionally. But the other one is, is not harmed in any way also. So it doesn't lose. Neither does it gain. So that is commensalism. I hope you can differentiate now between symbiosis and commensalism. In symbiosis, all the two organisms benefit. Then in commensalism, only one benefits nutritionally, but the other one is, is not harmed either. So examples of commensalism, we have the shark and the ramora. These are all fishes in water. The shark is a bigger fish, and usually when it is feeding, it cuts its, its prey before it swallows it. So the ramora is a smaller fish, attaches on the body of the shark, waiting for any droplets from the shark during the feeding. So for it, it picks any droplets that the shark leaves. So the shark neither benefits nor loses. But the ramora benefits nutritionally because for it, when the shark feeds, it also feeds. Meanwhile, for the shark, it does not either benefit nor lose. Another example is the cattle or the buffaloes and the white aigrettes, those birds. You always see birds on, uh, falling on, on top on the backs of the cows when they are grazing. Those are called white aigrettes. So those white aigrettes pick ticks on the skin of the cow or buffalo. And for them, they are benefiting nutritionally. So sometimes the cow allows them to pick and they pick whatever number they want. So for them, they benefit. The cow does not benefit nutritionally, but it's, it's not harmed also in a way. So that's another good relationship there. So you can see the buffalo there with enjoying and then the, the, the white aigrette enjoying a ride on the back of the buffalo and then the cow there as well bonding quite well with the aigrettes as you can see so you can now differentiate between symbiosis and commensalism and give different examples in symbiosis, both organisms are meant to benefit. In commensalism, majorly one organism benefits, but the other organism is not harmed either. Great. So let's look at another relationship here called predation. It's another feeding relationship between two organisms, the predator and the prey. Now, in this case, a predator is an organism who hunts and kills another for food. So a predator's role is to pursue, to hunt, to kill another organism, basically for food. I hope you know some of these organisms. For example, you at home, we have the cat, a predator for the rats. So the cat will chase, capture, kill, and eat the rat. So the cat now becomes the predator. And then the rat becomes the prey. 
Then the prey, of course, is an organism that is then killed for food. So you can define now what a predator is and what the prey is. So you can see there the leopard and the antelope. Which one is the predator in this case and which one is the prey? Well, we can see that the predator is the one which is hunting. Uh -huh. And that is the leopard in this case. That spotted animal, spotted cat-like animal is now the predator. And then the prey is the antelope. And then from this you can see the predatory birds trying to pick the prey from the ground. Great. So in these relationships, usually we have graphs that we the, that are plotted to show the relationship between the predator and the prey. And this curve is the a curve of population against time for both the predator and the prey. In this case, we have the predator as the fox there, the red fox, the, the that uh, orange fox you can see, and then the prey is the rabbit there. So we can see the two curves. Can you describe them and explain them? Yes. Great. So let's describe it together. So in this relationship, in the beginning you can see that uh, the population of the prey is higher than the population of the predator initially. Remember the prey is the food for the predator. The predator depends on the prey. So the population of the prey is higher than that of the predator. That is typical. You expect that the food should be more than those who are eating it. That is eventually what you expect. So that's why you see there the predator numbers are fewer and the prey numbers are high. So as you can see, as the prey numbers increase, also the predator numbers increase. Why do you think so? Simply because the prey is food for the predator. When there is enough food, then you expect the population of the predator to increase because they will have enough food, they will be able to reproduce and feed the young ones to maturity. Great. Now when the predator population increases, you are seeing that the prey population is starting to decrease. As the predator population continues to increase, the prey population falls or drops rapidly. Why do you think so? Well, like we said before, the predator eats the prey. So when the eaters increase, then the eaten will decrease. When the predator increases, the number of the predator increase, then the prey population will drop, will reduce, because they have been eaten rapidly. Now you can see when the prey population again falls so low, the predator population also begins to, to decline. Why do you think so? Simply because the food now is no more, and the predator will not have anything to eat. So its population will also, they will die. They will not be able to reproduce. And their number will decrease. So as the, as the predator population decreases below, then the prey now will have a chance to increase again. Because those ones eating them have decreased in number. And the curves continue like that, alternating continuously like that. So what you can pick from these curves is that the predator feeds on the prey. When the predator population increases, then you expect the prey to decrease because it will, the prey will be eaten and their population will drop. And so on and so forth. As you can see, you can also see another one. I hope this one you can describe. Uh, you can describe this one very well. It is a similar relationship there. You can see the blue one being the prey population and then the green one is the predator. So usually the, 
the prey population is higher than the predator you expect that there will be more prey population more prey in the community in the ecosystem compared to the predators for the obvious reasons the prey provide food to the predators the explanation is the same and uh, another one is there oh uh, great so in summary you can see that initially the population of the prey is higher than that of the predator now this leads to an increase in number of the predators like we said before because the predators feed on the prey so when the prey population is higher then the predator will also increase because it will have enough food however the number of the prey reaches the peak earlier than that of the predators that is true further increase in the predator population leads to decrease in the prey population because the prey is being fed by the predators so when the number of the prey goes or decreases and becomes very low the predator have a shortage of food they then starve and die and this makes their population also to decrease when the number of predator decreases below that of the prey then the prey population again increases because the predators are few which would feed on them so that is what we have just explained there so the, the that is a, a relationship between a prey and the predator the predator feeds on the prey yeah thank you very much so in general both the predator and the prey control the population of each other so you realize that when the other population increase when the prey population increases also the predator increases when the prey population decreases also the, the predator decreases so they control the population of each other in an ecosystem so let's look at the adaptations of predators to living in an ecosystem what are those features that predators have that enable them to be successful in an ecosystem the predators we are talking about the carnivores like the lions the, the bigger cats and so on you can imagine them in an ecosystem one of them is that they have keen sight to see their prey there is a an uh, an eagle called the bald eagle that feeds on fish it's able to see fish even up to one meter deep in the water when it is far away on top and it's able to come and pick it so that is that explains how keen their sight is an eagle can even see chicken on the ground when it is very far very many meters above and comes without enemies and then picks the chicks or the chicken so that makes them perfect perfect predators the other one is they have strong jaws or jaw muscles to tear flesh of the prey you have seen how these organisms feed they have very strong jaws they also have very sharp canines canine teeth for tearing the muscles eh? and then they have sharp claws to hold and kill the prey you have probably interacted with a cat at home you see how sharp the fingernails are the claws so that is how they capture the rats and all of them are like that including the higher predators they talk lions talk about the leopards the cheetahs even the eagles the predator birds have very sharp claws and the the reason is one it's an adaptation to hold the prey firmly so that the prey doesn't escape the other one is they move very fast to enable them chase the prey they move swiftly you have seen how they run you have seen how the cat captures the rat and they are able to move even without noise they have pads on the bottom of their legs that reduce noise there is no noise as they move that is a perfect adaptation then their bodies are streamlined to cut through air during movement you have seen how the cat moves 
it is almost pointed in in front it reduces its uh, height in front as, as it is moving to streamline its shape so as to minimize air resistance during uh, locomotion then some of them have very sharp canines we've already talked about that you have seen leopards leopards don't feed on the ground when they capture their kill for example when they get the, the the antelopes they have to carry them up to the tree but what do they use for holding them the sharp canines and then they have colors which help them to camouflage camouflaging means resembling or blending with the environment so when you see the lions their color resembles the dry grass and even the leopards are the same so it's difficult to see them so they can use that advantage for ambushing the prey and capturing the prey great and many others you can search for more and more the other one we also look want to look at also the adaptations of the prey to live in an ecosystem how are the prey adapted uh, one is they perceive sound with a high accuracy and are able to sense their predators at a distance so the prey have also adopted a very good sound receiving system you have probably seen antelopes feeding either in a documentary or even goats at home they're even able to twist their ears to, to different directions to capture sound to listen what is happening they can stand still without moving and then they begin twisting their ears and they have usually very large ears look at the antelopes for example so that is one of the adaptations they have to detect the presence of the predator in the environment the other one is they are fast they move also very fast you have probably seen them running it's difficult to catch them in fact lions cannot catch antelopes under ordinary situations if they are put in a race together they cannot catch them so for them they have the other advantage of ambushing that is what they use but chasing them it is very difficult it's only those champions in running like the cheetahs who may attempt to chase directly but even then they also have to hunt in a group so these organisms the prey are very fast and then they have developed structures for defense such as horns we have probably seen the horns of the buffaloes in fact it's difficult for the lions to kill a buffalo unless if they come in a big number they have very strong horns if they knock they can easily cause severe harm or even death and then they, are, they normally move in groups to scare the predators yeah you see animals grazing they graze in a very big group so that it's difficult for the predator to attack and then they prefer to stay in areas which give them good visibility such as in grasslands when they are grazing they usually choose to graze in a in a flat land in a, in a grassland where there is no where there are no many trees so that they can easily spot the predator coming and similarly they also have very good colors for camouflage colors that make them resemble uh, the habitat for example you can look at uh, the one we saw here earlier you can look at these organisms look at the antelope there and its habitat they purely blend if the hide is in the grass it's very difficult for you to see so it is one of the mechanisms they employ in order to avert the predators and then the other one is mimicry mimicry is uh, where a palatable harmless organism attains colors of unpalatable harmful organism and to confuse the, the, the predators now this is a tendency of an organism to resemble another organism which is not preferred which is not eaten by the predator such that it can uh-huh you resemble an organism which is not 
eaten so that you are mistaken and you are also left in, in that way you also survive so it is an interesting phenomenon that they employ as well to prevent uh, being predated upon so members at least now we can be able to tell the adaptations of the prey to survive predation and also the adaptations of the predator to be able to catch the prey so all of them have adaptations that enable them to survive in their ecosystems so an example of camouflage is also there you can see that lizard are you able to see it well on first sight it may be difficult for you even to see it is a very good example of camouflage so the lizard there is hiding it is blending perfectly and difficult to see the predators may not see it at a long distance unless if you move closer so that is what we call camouflage otherwise thank you very much and we meet in the next lesson